The prologue to the movie begins with a haunting scene of a man coming out of his house and standing in the pitch black outside. He then offers some prayers and cleans himself up, with the help of tap water. The man looks tense. He picks up a bottle of some acid lying on the window, pours it in a bowl, and takes it inside, from where horrifying screams can be heard. It's as if he is torturing someone. The man quickly comes back out, pours the other bottle in the bowl, and in a chilling display of savagery, drinks it. The acid burns his mouth, throat, and perhaps even his soul as he falls down, writhing in pain. Moments later, he passes away, and only his lifeless body is left behind. We are unaware of why he did what he did, and who was inside. The scene changes and the movie cuts to the present, where we see a loving family of three, including the mother Hikrin, the infant son Biral, and the father Adnan. Hikrin is home alone with her son, who is crying for no apparent reason. It is his first birthday, and Hikrin has baked a beautiful cake. Meanwhile, Biral's father is on his shift at the hotel. As he hangs up the phone, his co-worker comes in and takes over, as the man picks up a gift he bought for his son's birthday and heads home. Back home, Birol is still crying non-stop. Hikrin takes him to the bedroom and sits him with the toys. As she comes out, she gets a call from her husband, and tells him how much Birol is crying and not letting her do work. The couple talk very lovingly and the family looks happy. She hangs up the phone and decides to make some tea, when suddenly a strange feeling of cold envelops her. She faintly hears her son call, but does not pay any heed to it. Suddenly the cupboard beside Birol starts shaking vehemently. And as the poor child looks helplessly at the menacing object, it finally drops flat on him. Hearing the noise, Hikrin comes running, the scene before her devastating her entire life. The poor mother's heart shatters into a million pieces right on the spot, who would have been able to withstand the pain of losing their child. Fast forward to three months later, in the cemetery, Hikrin praying over her son's tomb alone, crying her heart out. Afterwards, she comes back home and is cleaning the wall where the cupboard once stood when suddenly Adnan comes in. The family dynamic has totally changed. He is no longer the loving husband that he once was. His words carry bitterness, and his eyes show indifference towards the poor woman. It is pretty clear that he blames his wife for their son's passing. He calls her an irresponsible mother, who he will never be able to forgive for taking the life of his son. The man shouts at her and goes away. Poor helpless Hikrin, carrying both grief and guilt, falls down to the ground and blames herself for everything. She claws at her body and cries her soul out. As she is crying inside the room, she is unaware of the two menacing black-clothed spirits who pass by her door. The family is grief-stricken to the point of destruction. Adnan watches his son's videos on his phone and cries in a corner on his shift, while Hikrin cries over her son's clothes. That night, Adnan comes home and acts all different. He smiles strangely and kisses Hikrin on the forehead as he comes in. The man talks about how he told his brother about his son, and he said he would come home to meet him. Hikrin is terrified because Adnan's brother passed away when he was a teenager. Suddenly someone bangs on the door and Adnan asks her to open it. As she gets to the door, the man who was talking with her vanishes, and an angry Adnan appears on the other side of the door. Turns out she was seeing things. The poor woman thinks she has gone mad out of grief. The next day, she meets a friend of hers named Einar, whom she confides in. She tells her about the things that she is sensing and seeing. Einar tells her of one time when she was afflicted by a disease that could not be cured, and she went to a spiritual teacher named Abdullah Haja, who has knowledge of the unknown. Hikrin becomes furious at her friend. She tells her that she is already facing so many troubles, and her friend is asking her to go around in search of nonsense. She refuses to go, and angrily leaves the poor friend, who only wanted to help her. On the other side, in a remote village, we see Hikrin's mother and grandmother obediently offering their prayers. Meanwhile, Hikrin is walking back home when suddenly she sees the same cupboard that slaughtered her only child lying on the footpath. The cupboard moves vehemently, and finally drops down, revealing two dark evil spirits standing behind it. Poor scared Hikrin gasps. When suddenly a vehicle passes before the scene and it ultimately vanishes, leaving her cold and questioning her sanity once more. She gets home to find her husband smoking and avoiding her, as usual. At night, the woman has a nightmare. She wakes up in the middle of the night to see a pregnant woman lying on her back, shouting in pain as a black-clothed demon slices her stomach and drags out a bloody strange doll from inside her. The woman looks back at Hikrin and asks for her child. Hikrin shouts in fear. Adnan comes running after hearing an ear-splitting scream, but then ignores the poor scared woman and goes back out. All alone and scared, Hikrin cries herself to sleep. The next morning, back at the village, we see the grandmother knitting something for Hikrin. It looks as if the two women dearly love her. Meanwhile, back in her apartment, Hikrin keeps washing her deceased son's clothes again and again, to feel a sense of connection. She hangs them out and comes back to find Adnan sitting in the kitchen. She tries to talk to him, but the man coldly ignores her and ultimately, she gives up, leaving him alone. In the afternoon, she decides to go to her son's grave. As she cries over the grave, she finds the two menacing evil spirits standing in the corner. Scared, she quickly leaves and comes back home to find her son's clothes gone from where she hung them. With a racing heart, she runs inside to look for them in the small chest where she keeps his things. She opens it and is terrified to find it filled with blood-red liquid with her son's photo floating about. As she holds the picture, suddenly a strange doll springs up and floats before her. The woman shrieks in fright and runs outside, holding her beating heart. 
Outside, she finds the clothes back in their place. The next day, a desperate Hikrin seeks her friend's help again, and this time she decides to go to Haja. Once there, Einar gives her moral support as she shakes in fear and anticipation. Inside, she sees a little pale-faced and blonde-haired boy quietly sitting to the side. They go in and sit on the other side, and the man hands her a page to write down her name three times. When she is done, the man uses a small pin to nip her finger and take out a little drop of blood to smear on the page with her name. He folds the page and puts it in a glass, pouring water over it. The man says a prayer and blows into the glass, which he then gives to the little boy to drink. The woman tells the Haja that these hauntings have been happening since she was a child, but now, they have become more violent. The man tries to give her strength by saying that if there were no evil, there would be no goodness in this world. He tells her not to worry, and they will definitely get to the bottom of this haunting to restore her peace. Suddenly the Haja starts chanting something, and the little boy comes to sit beside them. They have a huge plate containing water before them. As the Haja chants, the face of the little boy transforms in the reflection, and he starts to speak to the man. He tells him about the strange spell cast on the poor woman's family, and shows him their tragic past. The ritual ends, and Haja takes the exhausted child outside. He comes back to tell the woman that she should not worry about her son, since he is in heaven under the protection of the angels, but she has been trapped in a deadly spell. Someone, probably one of her aunts, has cast the ancient evil 41 stitches spell on her family. Ahaja tells her that the ancient spell can be done with 41 different intentions, and unless and until they know the persona and the intention, they cannot undo it. The man tells her to not lose hope and keep believing in God. They will definitely overcome this affliction. Hikrin thanks Haja and comes back home. While at home, she sits on the sofa working when she hears strange noises. She gets up to investigate, but can't see anything. A little later, she hears the noise again and gets up to see two possessed evil spirits looking like her mother and grandmother. Poor woman watches in horror at speaking in an ancient unknown language. They go as fast as they come. Shaken by the strange scene, she worries about her family and decides to go meet them in the village. She arrives there at night, while her grandma is offering her prayers, and her mother is doing the house chores. Hikrin warmly greets her mother and grandmother. She reveals to them that she had a bad dream about them, so she decided to come and spend some days at home. While at home, during dinner, she asks her mother about her paternal aunt, who happens to have been diagnosed with breast cancer. Her mother sighs and comments that indeed, the Lord would never let anyone off with ill-gotten gains. Turns out she was the one who fought with them regarding some land. Hikrin sighs and timidly asks for more information. She probes her mother to tell her more about her Aunt Sarah. She makes the excuse that while conversing with her friend Einar, this topic came up, and now she is just curious. Her mother tells her how her sister's monstrous husband was a gambler, and how he took his own daughter's her mother cries as she narrates the story to Hikrin. Zara had two daughters, Gulbahar and Gulzar, who were nine and four respectively. As she speaks, there are flashbacks of a strange doll and spells. Afterwards, her mother goes inside, while Hikrin decides to call Adnan and let him know that she has come back home for a few days. She calls Adnan, but he does not pick up. That night, Hikrin sleeps with her grandmother. She cries, hugging her and saying how painful it has been for her. Her mother overhears her cries from the other room and breaks down. Hikrin's mother wakes up to some crunching noises from her pillow and gets up. Ignoring the feeling, she tries to go back to sleep, but the noise persists. Startled, she gets up to see her pillow slowly oozing blood. It starts to rip apart from the middle, and strange ugly creatures emerge from it. The terrified woman shrieks as two black-clothed possessed spirits stand behind her. Suddenly the door bangs, and the evil spirits leave. As she looks back, the pillow is as good as new. The next day, back at his shift in the hotel, Adnan happens to babysit his workmate's son. He quickly gets emotional and begs the little boy to call him father. Suddenly the boy's real father comes along and quickly takes his son away from his grasp. An emotional Adnan quickly leaves the room. Back on the other side, Hikrin goes to visit her aunt Sarah's village, but comes up with nothing. As it turns out, their family migrated from the village approximately 15 to 20 years ago. On the other side, Adnan, severely grief-stricken, takes a mysterious thing covered in a white cloth from inside his cupboard and goes to his son's grave. The poor man sits there, crying his heart and soul out, missing his deceased son dearly. Moments later, he takes out the thing he took with him, and it turns out to be a gun. In a moment of dreadful horror, the man puts the gun in his mouth and along with the never-ending cycle of grief. Poor thing, how desperate he must have been. On the other side, Hikrin calls him, not knowing that just like her little son, her husband has also left her all alone in this world. She is walking to her maternal aunt's home in her village to know more about what happened. As she crosses the road, a woman sees her and asks what she wants. Hikrin inquires about the house and the woman, although she warns her of the dangers lurking in the house, eventually guides her there. As the woman walks back, she sees the two evil spirits accompanying her. She crosses the path to finally reach her aunt's house. The place looks haunted and isolated from every angle. She slowly and fearfully steps towards it and sees strange objects dangling from the tree outside. Taking a deep breath, she enters. As she steps in, the door bangs shut and she keeps hearing strange hisses and noises. Things keep moving on their own, and she hears the sound of laughter echoing all around her. 
Horrified, with her heart on her sleeve, she enters the room where two poor souls in white stand in a corner. As she looks around at the photographs, she feels something moving on the bed, below the sheets. She peels away the clothes to find the same doll that has been haunting her horror-filled visions. The terrorized woman bravely picks it up, when she is suddenly attacked by a burned corpse. She shrieks and runs out of the house with the doll in hand. Hickron comes back home with a pounding headache. She tells her mother that she is going to take a rest. As she looks at the doll, inside her room, her mother comes in with a pillow for her, and she quickly hides it. She again starts to inquire about her aunt, and asks if they have any pictures she can look at. Her mother suspiciously denies it at first, but then upon her insistence, gives her the boxes containing pictures, to look and find for herself. That night, Hickron sees glimpses of strange haunted scenarios. The woman startles awake, and her mother, who has woken up for prayer, comforts her. She goes back to sleep, and her mother goes to the next room to awaken her grandmother, so they can offer their prayers together. The woman takes out the prayer mat and comes to awaken the old woman, when suddenly she hears her sister's voice calling her from inside the cupboard. Startled, she looks back at the cupboard. The older woman has also woken up. Sarah keeps calling from inside the cupboard and asking for her baby. She slowly goes towards it, but there's nothing inside when she opens it. She shuts the door, but suddenly the voice starts again, saying she stole her baby and she should give it back. She walks back to the cupboard, and when she opens it, a possessed spirit of Zara sits inside with her two daughters. She suddenly springs up, asking for her baby. Startled and terrified, the woman shuts the door with a gasp and looks back to find Zara on the bed. She shrieks in horror, making Hickron wake up and come running in from the next room. Her mother finally calms down and tells her that everything is good. The next day, Hickron returns home in search of Adnan, not knowing the tragedy that befell him. She comes looking for him at the hotel, but his colleague there also has not seen him for a few days. She comes home, where she hears a strange noise coming from her room. As she enters, she sees her son's grave encircled by black-clothed evil spirits. On top of her son's grave sits her aunt, with the strange doll in hand. She looks at her and whispers how she was also supposed to have a son. The possessed woman gets up and tries to attack Hickron, but she quickly flees the scene. The terrified Hickron arrives at Hodge's abode and shows him the doll. The man carefully inspects it, and while reciting a prayer, slowly opens the stitches, taking out the chit inside it. In it, an evil spell has been written. To her utter horror, Hodger reveals that the doll was used during casting of the 41 stitches spell. He tells her how the intention of the merciless perpetrators was to summon a demon to destroy her family. This type of spell has its effects carried over to the next generation, hence why it is the evilest of them all. The Haja tells her that her mother's sister was the one who cast this spell. The grieving woman cries, since her aunt has already passed away. How can they be relieved of this affliction? The Haja comforts her and tells her to bring her mom, so together, they can look for a solution. Back at home, Hickron's grandmother falls sick. Her mother brings the old woman medicine, and together they talk about how Hickron looks worn out and sad. As the woman speaks, she strangely goes quiet mid-sentence. The older woman looks in horror as the other suddenly gasps. Her face turns ashen gray, and she falls on her back, lifeless. The grandmother shakes in terror as she flees the scene. She comes to sit outside, and quickly picks up her taspi, trying to call out to a superior power for help. Meanwhile, to know the truth, Hickron goes back to her mother's house. She sees her trembling grandmother seated on the sofa. Scared, she runs to her and asks what is wrong. She probes about her mother's whereabouts, when suddenly her grandma starts speaking as if something is pushing her to speak. In an unnatural voice, she reveals that Nekmai, Hickron's mother, harbored a deep sense of jealousy towards her sister Zara. In a flashback, we see Zara, happily married to Ramazan and blessed with two beautiful daughters, aged nine and four, living a life of contentment. However, Ramazan longed for a son, someone who could protect their precious daughters. Learning of his yearning, Nekmai cunningly suggests that her mother-in-law holds the key to their desires, and that she could arrange a prayer that would ensure for them to give birth to a baby boy. Intrigued and hopeful, Zara and Ramazan agree to seek her assistance. Rumored to possess ancient knowledge and powerful rituals, she is believed to have the ability to alter fate. With utmost care, the mother-in-law inscribes a small chit of paper with unseen words, placing it within a doll. She meticulously stitches the doll 41 times, each stitch filled with profound significance. Assuring Zara and Ramazan that their wishes will be fulfilled, the mother-in-law tells them to keep the doll under their pillow. Eagerly, the couple embraces the unknown outcome of the mysterious ritual, their hearts brimming with hope and happiness. After some days, Ramazan starts to behave strangely distant. He becomes furious for no reason, as if something possessed him. Within a few days, the man does the unthinkable, then he goes to take his wife's life, while she is praying, but he isn't able to, as if something is protecting Zara. In his maddened state, he rushes outside and lights Quite literally, Zara comes running out to see the horror before her eyes. Seven months later, a grieving Zara gives birth to a baby girl. During this time, Nekmei and her mother-in-law help the poor woman. However, hidden beneath Nekmei's seemingly benevolent facade lies a sinister motive. Burdened by her own struggles with infertility, Nekmei succumbs to jealousy and desperation. In an act of betrayal, she seizes the opportunity presented by the baby's birth and steals the newborn from Zara's embrace. Soon after delivering, Nekmei suffocates her sister Zara to oblivion with a pillow. The horrors of jealousy 
and greed. A horrified and breathless Hikrin finally finds that she is in fact Zara's daughter, and that the woman she calls her mother is in fact the perpetrator who schemed against her family and destroyed her life. The women she cared for her entire life turned out to be her biggest enemies and the reason behind her destruction and woes. In a moment of utter seething, she gets up and rushes to see the woman she called mother and finds Nekmai lifeless in her room. The poor woman cries out in helplessness. She feels as if she has gone mad. Back outside, the old woman keeps talking to herself. She reveals how her son found out about the things she did and splashed. He drank the acid afterwards. Turns out the man in the prologue was her son and Nekmai's husband. It shows how karma never spares anyone. Whatever goes around, comes around. She destroyed another person's family, and her own was destroyed in effect. Her last words are an apology for her deceased son, and a plea for forgiveness. Hikrin, on the other hand, returns home and finds the spirit of her husband waiting there on the dining table. The broken woman cries and apologizes to him. It was, after all, the curse of her family that took their son and caused the man to go insane. She slowly comes in to find all her real family members and her son's spirits, sitting there waiting for her. The movie ends with a haunting note about the true story it was based on. It says that the woman stayed with her deceased husband and child for a span of almost two months. The spell was eventually broken by Abdullah Haja, and the poor woman remarried afterwards. Hope she finds peace after all the horrors that she went through.